couple of hundred. Skoda's brand new Fabia takes on two serious city car challengers. Cheap to run, easy to park and with the added bonus of boot space. It's no surprise that nearly a third of all cars sold in the UK are super minis. In this week's Driven 100, we're testing three of the latest offerings. The Skoda Fabia, the Rover 25 and the facelifted Polo. It's a Skoda. Yes, it's a Skoda. It's a Skoda! No, honestly, it's okay. It's not a joke. The Skoda Fabia, on first impressions, feels like a terrific little car. And I certainly don't see its two rivals laughing. Chunkily styled, generously equipped and superbly well made. This is the super mini sized Skoda that the Czech company hopes will demolish its dodgy image forever. Rover is another company grappling with serious image problems. The 25 is basically an old Rover 200 hatch downsized to cope with the booming super mini market. It's better built, more refined and great fun to drive, but is that enough to cure Rover's alien fortunes? No such worries for the Volkswagen Polo. This is premium super mini with a bulletproof image and equally bulletproof residual values. Volkswagen claim this car is 80% new, but is it 80% better? Super minis are ideal town cars, great for nipping around. Later in the Driven 100, we'll be testing their handling through a slalom course and sending them up a one in three hill. All their little engines pull them up to the top but first, we let them loose in the city. In an ever more sophisticated marketplace, your car isn't just about transport, it's about you and your personality. So we've got three very label conscious young women, exactly the sort of people that this week's free cars are aimed at. Is there such a thing as badge snobbery? Well, over to Emily, Amy and Eugenie. The girls are gonna hit the town in our super minis to give us their verdict on how they drive and how they look. First up, the Rover. First impressions, instantly. Um, yes, it feels so slow. It doesn't go, like, bouncing off when you accelerate. No. But for nipping around the streets, it's it's lovely. It feels small and neat and... I think yeah, it's, it's a sort good. of middle-aged woman's car. <laughs> <laughs> You've got all the sort of fake wood little trimmings. Yeah. Yes. W would you like that? Well, I mean, I don't think it's yes, too bad, Yes, it's a nice actually. touch. It's a bit like a gentleman's drinking club. Yes. <laughs> Like, There's not a vast amount um, of storage space, actually, to be honest. You don't think so? Is there a drinks holder? No. No, certainly not. Well, ticking off for that, there should always be a drinks holder. <laughs> what you got in the back there? We haven't got Nothing. any pockets. Nothing. We haven't got it's any... It's a Rover, very short on storage space this yeah. time. There's some place there to put your cassettes, but um, not enough. Suitably unimpressed, the girls leave our gentlemen's club on wheels for some light refreshment before hitting the road in the polo. Hello, ladies. Jump in. Jump in. Welcome to the Polo. So what do you think? I love yes. it. Very Amy, nice. It feel? <laughs> Very nice indeed. A little Ooh. bit bumpy. Oops. Yes, it is a bit. Suspension's a disaster, yeah. suddenly. The gearbox feels springy, a bit looser. It's not as natty and... That's undyed. a technical term, of yes. course. Natty. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I see what you mean about the springy um, gearbox. Mm. Brakes. Brakes, good. They work. Yep. The OBS is standard as well. And dual airbags on here, so... Nice That's a good safe. package for the money, nice and safe, yeah. But what's it like in the back? Is there plenty of space? Yes, there is, yeah. Yes. Lack of pockets, but it's very nice upholstery. Quite tasteful, isn't Classic it? Classic and tasteful, exactly. So you like the inside? Do you like the dash? I do, yeah. It's very funky and modern and... Um, I feel like it's a racing car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Top marks for the polo. The girls like it. Or is it just that sparkly chrome badge that they've fallen in love with? Next up, the Fabia. It should be good. Skoda, now owned by Volkswagen, have based the Fabia on a platform that the Polo will have to wait another two years for. But that name, the brunt of many jokes, could be a problem. So to give it a fighting chance, we've covered up all the badges so the girls won't have a clue what they're driving. Right, this is the mystery car. Any idea at all what you're driving at the moment, Jim? Um, feels a bit like, a, or looks a bit like a Citroen but gadgets may suggest it would, it would be a Volkswagen. I don't like the sound of the engine one little bit. It's like a tank, actually, compared to that Rover. It's sort of very big and sturdy. Mm. Very, very easy, smooth Yeah, gear. good gear change, yeah. isn't it? Feels like slightly more acceleration than the Rover. Brakes are nice. 
I think this this car looks nice nice on the outside. And it's very spacious on the inside as well. But um, I think the it grey looks, interior looks completely unfresh. I think it looks <laughs> cheap. You think it looks yeah, cheap? Yeah, it does. It looks in, in the inside. It doesn't look like it fits properly anywhere yeah. either. Yeah. I can't wait to find out what it is. And the waiting is nearly over. Which car will be at the top of their shopping list? Right, the question is, Rover, cars for OAPs or what? Emily, you're not an OAP, you were driving the Rover 25, what do you reckon? Um, I reckon it was a good drive, Jason, it was sort of smooth, better than I thought actually, but they do have a sort of stigma attached to them, that sort of travelling salesman, sort of middle-aged man kind of image. <laughs> what, Alan Porter's kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. That, that sort of thing. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Amy, well, you, were, you were in the polo, weren't you? You liked the polo, didn't you? Well, we had to say the polo is the out-and-out -out winner. Um, we loved Definitely. it. We loved the inside, the outside, and we thought it was a good drive as well. But you were yeah. a bit, bit partial to the... Yeah, I must say, driving um, the mystery car yes. was, was good. It definitely drives well, and we thought for a moment that it actually probably drives better than the Polo. Yeah. Um, but the inside, the, the interior seriously lets it down. Can I just ask, none of you would be too unhappy to have this parked outside your flat, would you? No. Yeah. no. <laughs> I think that's our cue to reveal the identity of the mystery car, Mr. The Brewer. mystery <laughs> car, go <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> <Skull -over. laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask that question again. Would any of us rate you be unhappy if you had the Skoda parked outside your flat? Well, to take it back to what we were saying earlier, <laughs> yes. But actually, no, I'm quite impressed by the Skoda. I think if we sort yes. of permanently had that bit of sticky tape there, yes. then it would be quite good. <laughs> ah, so there is such a thing as bed snobbery then. Yeah. Yeah. So there we have it. Well, the Volkswagen Polo is still the winner in the desirability stakes amongst fashion conscious young buyers. Be a mirage. <laughs> no, it's not a mirage. It's not even a Safran or a Kangoo. It's the new Renault Scenic RX4. The RX4 is the latest in a long line of good ideas from Renault, a company that has cornered the market in forward-thinking family transport for years. They pretty much invented the people carry it in the 80s with the Aspas, so everyone's keeping an eye on their latest move. Then the Scenic headed a new wave of mini MPVs, car-sized people carriers with a whole host of little inventions, like this to keep even the most dysfunctional family happy. Cheers, guys. And now there's this, a scenic with a difference. Renault's attempt to shake up the compact sports utility sector currently populated by the likes of Freelander, the Toyota RAV4, Suzuki's Vitara and the Honda CRV. But it doesn't look anything like them, does it? That's because while the others are essentially Jeeps trying to be people carriers, the Scenic RX4 is a people carrier with four-wheel drive as an afterthought. And the advantages to that are obvious. A car like the Scenic has been designed to carry passengers in comfort with practicality all round. There's tables in the back, there's more cup holders than you can shake a fizzy drink at, and there's cubby holes everywhere. The rear door opens in two stages, and of course, like all Scenics, the rear seats fold down and come out to give you masses and masses of room. There's bags of space in there. You can fit a donkey in there. <gasps> On the outside, the RX4 differs from the standard Scenic with sportier headlamps, an integrated nudge bar, fatter 16-inch alloys, and a huge growth on the back containing the spare wheel. All of which add up to make this car look a lot more meaner than the basic model. But its slightly tacky plastic protection mouldings on the doors and nose don't seem to be very well stuck on. And I'm not sure they'll be as black and as new looking as this in a couple of years down the line. And the 140 brake horsepower 2 litre engine feels pretty pokey, but I will say a bit harsh when pushed to the limit, and it's not going to set any land speed records with a 0 to 60 time of 11 seconds. You'd almost do as well to opt for the slower but much more economical 1.9 diesel engine instead, with a claimed 38 miles per gallon on average. For the driver, everything is pretty well thought out. Both trim levels available for the RX4 come with high spec, with air conditioning as standard, 
thank goodness. And this raised seating position that gives fantastic all-round visibility that you'd expect to find in an MPV. And that reminds me, this isn't just a people carrier, it's got four by four as well. So let's off-road. <laughs> And on this dirt track, I have to say, hey, it's not doing too bad. It's got a much higher ground clearance than the Scenic, so obviously it'll ride over these ruts and bumps a lot smoother. It's also got 16-inch wheels with dirty great big tyres, so little rocks and pebbles, way don't cause a problem at all. The RX4's permanent four-wheel drive mainly feeds the front wheels, but shifts power to the rear when it senses a slip. But despite this, the front wheels do spin quite alarmingly at times making you wonder if this system really is preferable over the more traditional four-wheel drive setups. My guess is that the people that will buy into the RX4 will be after the sportier image of a 4x4, but with all the practicalities of an MPV. Considering the amount of time you're likely to spend off-road, this really is a good compromise, even if it is £2,000 more expensive than the standard front-wheel drive scenic. The only trouble is, it's not available until June, so I suppose this must be a mirage after all. <laughs> While Mike's been in Morocco, I've been test driving the new Porsche 911 Turbo. It's all on our website, www.4car.co.uk. After the break, we'll be finding out which of this week's Super Minis handles the best in our slalom course, and which has enough pulling power to get up a one and three hill. Yo, and CD price. Welcome back. Later, the Super Mini shootout continues in the Driven 100. But first, Paul Ripley. Throughout the series, I've shown you how to survive a range of extreme driving situations. But some of the disciplines I teach go far beyond those that the average driver would ever need to know or use. Today, I'm going to show you the most extreme of those disciplines involving manoeuvres that would only and must only ever be used by a small select band of highly trained professional drivers. We've all seen it in the movies, but carjacking really does happen. Professional drivers need to know how to get out of trouble fast. In this exercise, our stuntman in the white van is going to try and force me to a stop. OK, on this little anti-hijack terrorist exercise, we're going to do a fairly simple one that majority of professional chauffeurs would actually use. This is called a handbrake turn. It's coming now, it's coming now. What's he doing? I'm really not sure what's going on. Best get out of the way. We confused him. The forward spin is the most basic evasive manoeuvre. It involves applying the handbrake, declutching and steering at the same time and gets professional drivers out of a tight spot. We're now going to look at one of the most commonly used anti-hijack manoeuvres. This is called the J-turn or the reverse spin. My goodness me, these two vans have blocked the way. I really don't like this. An extreme situation in the making. Into reverse. Into first gear. We're slamming away, and away we go. Just escaped a severe situation. The J-turn or reverse spin is often used by the police. The driver reverses briskly and spins the steering wheel through 90 degrees before driving off in the opposite direction. I've had this chap in this white van now following me for quite some time. I'm really getting quite worried about him. I'll try and confuse him with a full 360 degree turn. Rather dramatic, but generally effective. And break and turn. Opposite lock, opposite lock, back into first gear, pulling away as fast as I possibly can. It's simple, it's effective. The 360 spin is the most extreme evasive manoeuvre I teach. An extension of the forward spin, it requires a lot of speed, space and immense skill. It's used simply to confuse an attacker, yet again the driver uses a combination of steering, braking and declutching. Don't try this at home, on the public road or in the local supermarket car park. Above all, remember, safe driving! Want a sneak preview of what's happening at the Geneva Motor Show? Then log on to our website, www.4car.co.uk. 
Welcome back to the Driven 100, where our three super minis face an uphill battle. Now, small revy engines are all well and good for nipping in and out of traffic, but when faced with a steep hill, you're going to have to be pretty creative with the gearbox to keep the little engine alive. So Jason is going to drive up this one in three hill in third gear at 30 miles an hour to see which little car will pull him up the furthest without stalling. Yes, we all know that sinking feeling as your engine dies on you, slogging up a steady incline. Well, this test is designed to find out which car has the best mid-range pulling power for those uphill moments. How close to the top will they get? First up, the Skoda. And my foot's flat on the floor, and yeah, come on, you can do it, it's just, and there we are. Okay, so my glamorous assistant is running over to tell me. I look out the window and I can see that I am about 14 and a half metres short of the hill. So, let's go to Fabia. Not the car to have if you're living in San Francisco. Now the Rover 25. Again, it's 30 miles an hour in third gear. It's only got 84 horsepower this car, midway between the Volkswagen and the Skoda. Let's see how that manifests itself in a one and three gradient. So here we go. And, oh, no. There we are. We stalled. Oh my goodness. We're beyond the 25 metre mark. Less torque on tap than the other two. The hill proved too much for the Rover. Can the Polo become king of the hill? And there we are, and a bit of momentum. My stomach goes a bit light as I go up the hill, and... and let's have a look. We're looking at 14 and a half metres, my glamorous assistant is telling me. Quite the same as the Skoda, actually. The Fabia, let down by very poor throttle response, crawled up the hill just far enough to come in equal first with the Volkswagen Polo. And in a distant third with the least amount of pulling power, the Rover 25. Time to try out their handling. OK, so they're only super minis, but surely we can expect some fun from them. And we can definitely expect some safety. The foam blocks behind me over here herald the return of the famous driven slalom test. We'll be driving each of this week's three cars through them at a steady 40 miles an hour, the aim being well to find out which of them is best. Right, Penny, it's the Skoda Fabia. This has the very, very latest generation platform from the Volkswagen Group for its Super Minis. So it's fresher than that Polo. The Polo won't get this platform for another two or three years. Let's, Let's see if it's really missing out. Right, well, we're doing, what, 40 miles now through this slalom. And my word, it's, it's just brilliant. Steering's nice and light. It really sits ever so well through these cones. I think that's exceptional. Really feels very safe. The Skoda Fabia will be a tough act to follow. Solid handling and nicely weighted steering make light work of the slalom. Time for the next victim. It's a Rover, but it's a Rover 25. This car has adopted the stiffer suspension settings and possibly the hot hatch body control of the 200 VI, the old Rover hot hatch. Let's see how good it is. OK, now we're in the slalom. It feels very heavy and bulky, but the ride through here is brilliant. It's going through the slalom really fluidly, nice and balanced. Wow, very good. Yeah, felt good from where I was sitting. A good showing from the Rover 25 with a performance worthy of its hot hatch heritage. Next, please. Volkswagen reckons this car is 80% new, but crucially, what it doesn't have is the new platform. This is basically the old Polo freshened up with a bit of war paint, a bit of plastic surgery. Let's see if it feels like an old Polo compared to the new generation Skoda. Oh! Oh! Can I use your oh, answer? this is not <laughs> confidence inspiring at all. It's, it's really rolling, it? rolling and unpredictable and. Oh, oh, it's just oh, it's an oh car. <laughs> it's a bit lurchy. Mm, not good. I don't know about having a hole in the middle, there's a bit of a hole in the polo's reputation. No embarrassments for either the Skoda or the Rover in the slalom test, but with a lighter feel to the steering, the Skoda wins by a narrow margin. And the aged polo, well, it limps into a rather distant third. After our three tests, how have the Super Minis got on? Right, it's the all-important Driven 100, where we got 25 points up for grabs in each of our four categories, the first of which being drivability. 
in the Skoda Fabia. It's got the most dreadful throttle response of any car I think I've ever driven. The reason for that, 2005 emissions regulations. When we were on the slalom, it really was superb, wasn't it? It was, it was almost fun. <laughs> 19. Happy 19. Yeah, 19. 19. 19. Warmed over Rover 200. Who would have thought it, eh? Well, I certainly didn't expect to enjoy driving this. It's quite as much. It really does knock the old 200 into a cocked hat, as they yeah, say. I was really surprised when we were doing the slalom how good it was. But one, I cannot get comfortable in it. And two, the steering is too hefty and heavy. And the pause showing up hill means it only gets a 16. And the Polo. This is a fresh face on a car that has early 1990s handling qualities. The Skoda shows you the way forward. This car is going to handle like a Skoda in three years' time. 15 tops. It's so hard. So the Skoda wins on drivability. But how desirable is it? The girls, they absolutely loved it when they didn't until, know what it was. <laughs> until they saw that, that's going to compromise its design. Well, actually, a couple of them weren't 100% sure. I think it's cheap. It's not like it fits properly anywhere yeah. either. Yeah. Let down by a tacky interior, but we think a great all-rounder, so it gets 17. Talking of image problems, the Rover 25. Have you seen the inside? Have you both left your glasses at home? I mean, the inside it is, is bizarre. Hideous. I it's, mean, it's only bizarre in colour. Look but at actually, the seats. I'm... Have you seen the seats? Please look. Please. It's like a Draylon sofa. It's so bad. 16, Jase. 16, mm -hmm. Mike. Desirability on a polo. Now this car's desirable in Kensington, isn't it? Well, it's that bad. Yeah, isn't it? that's what they're after. They are bad snobs. Very nice upholstery compared to the other ones. Yeah, at least. it's quite tasteful. Isn't Classic it? and tasteful, exactly. A solid reputation and still the designer label to be seen in. The Polo scores 18. Easy to park five doors and a boot. All three should score well on practicality. Skoda first. It's got a great boot. The big windscreen makes it feel really airy yep. and loads of space, so it's, it's Good practical. score, 17. And how well will the Rover do? Smallish boot, yeah, smallish small boot. Yeah, smallish boot's much smaller. Um, I, feel, I feel quite claustrophobic in there, I'm afraid. Boot space is also a problem in the Polo. Both get 16. Now, cost of ownership. Our figures are based on initial purchase price and running costs over three years or 36,000 miles, but doesn't include insurance. Now, the Skoda falls right between the other two when it comes to cost per mile at 34.4p per mile, which is I mean, cheap. I it? suffer from hay fever and even I wouldn't sneeze at that. <laughs> <laughs> the Fabia gets a respectable 19. Now the Rover, 35.4p a mile, it's the, it's the most expensive yeah. of the three. Yeah, 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 but that extra p per mile buys you that extra bit of class. It does, it? yes, it does. You yeah. quite slippers on, bit of exactly. leather on the old thing. Yes. Exactly. I'm turning into my granddad. You are. Very. <laughs> 17. Yeah, go on then. Yes, and would you like a Hornix before we move on? And the Polo? 32.2p per mile, the cheapest of the three by far. The best residual values. The best residual yeah. value. This car is going to sell like hotcakes when it comes back on the second air market. People are going to fall over themselves to be seen in a polo. It beats the rest with a point stretching 20. And the scores? The Rover 25 has great looks, if not a great image. Middle of the road car for middle aged drivers? Certainly not. It gets 65. The Polo still has the looks despite its age. It scores a very respectable, ooh, misses, 69. And the Skoda Fabia, fantastic handling and stunning looks, but nothing's perfect. The Fabia's disappointing interior means a final score of 72. Well, there's a turn up for the books. If you want the feel of Harrods, but for happy shopper money, the Skoda Fabia is this week's Driven 100 winner. We'll see you next week. Next week's our last show in the current series and we've got three lottery winners and three really expensive cars. Which one would you choose?